this is indeed um, uh, an excellent uh, occasion to celebrate and that's the reason why we wanted to make it happen sooner uh, you know Srinivas Garu because you know the world at large and especially post pandemic all of us need more and more infusion of positive news and good news so Daifuku coming to Telangana and setting up a brand new factory with 450 crores of investment providing employment to 800 people 800 plus people was indeed something that we wanted to celebrate so my compliments to you the entire team of Daifuku on choosing you made the right choice I can tell you. you you've chosen Telangana and Hyderabad you've made the right choice but um, just a couple of things you know the Srinivas Garu seems to be a huge champion of uh, the manufacturing piece manufacturing ecosystem I think there's plenty of uh, you know industrialists in the audience who also are champions of manufacturing ecosystem before I came here I was uh, um, I had a meeting with the new US Consul General who's come to Hyderabad Jennifer Larson so she asked me a very interesting question she said uh, you know what do you think about manufacturing what do you think about services what do you think about uh, the primary sector you know, as an industries minister you need to obviously give me your perspective your state's perspective and how do you see this landscape changing over the next few years next few decades so one of the things I told her you know whoever I meet wherever I meet whichever industrialist whichever potential investor that I meet they have a renewed enthusiasm towards setting up a manufacturing base in India especially post the pandemic post COVID where the world has realized that there is too much dependence on China for everything for bulk drugs for medical supplies for everything literally and when the supply chain was disrupted I think every single industrialist be it small micro medium or large was affected in one way or another so the world has started really thinking uh, about this excessive reliance and excessive dependence on China you talk to the biggest of the biggest players the fortune 500 companies or even the smallest of players they all tell me the same thing they all tell you that there has to be a China plus one strategy you can manufacture in China for China but for the rest of the world needs we need to start looking at other bases now because we are similar in terms of our sizes China and India you know 1.4 billion people 1.4 billion people so in terms of the workforce in terms of think force people will draw that uh, you know oversimplified comparison and say if we are moving away from China a logical thing to go to logical place to go to would be India but when a lot of overseas investors be it Japanese or Americans or Europeans they ask me you know if China is able to do a few things in a certain way why can't India do it I only tell them one thing you know China is a a, a country which is very homogeneous which is very unique in terms of how it is structured in terms of how it is controlled in terms of how it is administered but India is very different India is a democracy to begin with India is not one but there are 28 different Indias if you ask me because of because of the federal structure we have each state is so uniquely empowered the makers of our constitution had envisioned India as a union of states so therefore each state and especially the gateway that you choose to enter India through will determine your impression of India will determine how easy you find doing business in India that's the that's the that's the general uh, you know uh, thought I leave with any of my potential investor having said that you know when I travel and uh, when I visit you know countries like uh, the US Japan and other large economies you know I was never more impressed than I was with uh, in Japan when I was in Japan and going back to what uh, Shinivas Garu was saying one of the things that struck me I mean besides everything that is nice about Japan you know the clean streets the beautiful landscape etc etc the one thing that stood out in my memory you know we had a meeting scheduled uh, with uh, the chairman of Suzuki Osamu Suzuki san so we traveled all the way to Hamamatsu from from Tokyo we took a nice bullet train we were there in one and a half hours uh, and we were ahead of time because I know the Japanese are sticklers for time they're very punctual right so I said you know I don't want to take chances I'm meeting a big man trying to bring him to India uh, to my state rather so I was there ahead of time I was there almost one hour ahead of time me Jayesh my entire team was there so what we were told was because we reached ahead of time they said you know he's in a board meeting why don't you actually go visit the Suzuki Museum I'm actually not a big fan of museums I said okay whatever I mean to kill time I'll go there spend some time and come back so we went into the Suzuki Museum 
we were, we were going around. Actually, when I ended up there, it was fascinating. When was the first Suzuki automobile made? You know, when did uh, this happen? When did that happen? It was very, very unique, very, very uniquely uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, positioned, that museum. And I even found one of Chiranjeevi Garu's pictures there. That's a different story. I'll save it for another day. But um, we were going through the museum. What, to, what I found, to my amusement, and to, which, I, which I thought was very intriguing, was there were a bunch of, I would say, seven or eight-year-old boys and girls from a school, all in school uniforms, going around the entire museum. I said, this is interesting. I mean, a, a grown adult like me, I might find this interesting, but what, what would this be of interest to any of these young kids, especially those in second grade or third grade? Why would this be of any interest to them? So I asked one of my Japanese friends there, I said, what are they doing here? What are the little kids doing here? He said, watch, watch what they're doing. What they've been doing there is, which was so, so amazing later on when I realized, they actually were, of course, given the tour of the place, shown automobiles and how automobile evolution happened in Suzuki, etc., etc. Then later on, they were led to, to a kiosk. A kiosk, you know, like the vending machine that we have for soda and, you know, other snacks. Typically, that would you, you'd run into in a hotel lobby or uh, in your office. There was one such vending machine where the kid could go and pick the color of the vehicle, the make of the vehicle, customize it and then click a few buttons and out would come a car with the kid's name on it, with the specific model he wanted, with the specific thing he wanted. I said, so what is the lesson you're trying to you know, impart to these kids here? He said, my Japanese friend said, design thinking, engineering from a very early age. We need to tell our kids that manufacturing really holds the key to the growth of the world, to, to the expansion of your thinking and to the expansion of your abilities because the world cannot do without, you know, we are, we are all seated on furniture here. I'm speaking in a mic. Each of this is manufactured somewhere in the world. Each of this is designed in a certain way. So what they're trying to inculcate in those young kids is design thinking from a very early age and also that importance that needs to be given to the manufacturing sector. You know, each of us, when we go back home or even if you look around here, there's plenty of Japanese products, there's plenty of Korean products in your living room. Please go back and uh, go, when you go back home today, please look around. There is a Sony television, there is a Panasonic air conditioner, there is a Toyota vehicle possibly you're running or a Honda, there is a Samsung phone they, that you may be using, there is a LG refrigerator possibly in your home. The point I'm trying to make is what I admire about a country like Japan and companies like Daifuku is the amazing tenacity, the amazing resilience they've shown over the last few decades. Remember, Japan was the only nation in the, country, in the world which had experienced the most tragic and most devastating atomic explosion, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In spite of that, despite that, despite earthquakes, despite tsunamis, despite natural contours, which are against, all the forces of nature are stacked up against them. But it's the human intellect, it's the brain that the, Jap that the Japanese have invested in. It's the humans that the Japanese have invested in that have really propelled them to be one of the largest economies in the world. In spite of having a very small population, with all the forces of nature stacked up against them, with even incidents like the Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, explosion, yet the Japanese today continue to rule the roost, continue to be a dominant force economically compared to the West and compared to Asia as well. Same applies to Korea. So th the one thought when, when Srinivas Garu says, you know, we need to focus on manufacturing. Yes, we need to focus on manufacturing. But what I told the U.S. Consul General is, we need to pick up the best elements from different parts of the world. India cannot and India does not have the latitude. India does not have the luxury to grow at its own pace. You cannot miss this opportunity. You have to seize this opportunity. We are uniquely positioned now where the world is looking at different manufacturing uh, uh, the world is looking at uh, alternate manufacturing locations outside of China. If India has to latch on to this, we have to do what the U.S. has done in the last 30 years in a span of next 10 years. We have to do what China has done in the last 25 years in the span of next 10 years. So we don't have the opportunity or we don't really have the luxury of leapfrogging. We have to pole vault. We have to jump a few hoops 
we have to cover a few bases and we have to focus on not just high-tech manufacturing or advanced manufacturing or smart manufacturing. We have to focus on basic manufacturing. We have to ensure we also get the efficient smart manufacturing as which is coming out as part of industry 4.0, industrial revolution 4.0. And we also have to ensure that we instill and inculcate design thinking at the school curriculum level. At a very young age, at a school curriculum level, at basic education level, and most importantly, even in the vocational training institutes that we have, the polytechnics, the ITIs, etc., etc., we also need to ensure. In fact, I was talking to Procter and Gamble yesterday, myself, Jayesh, we had a meeting with them. And right after the meeting, when I told them that I want you to enter, and I want you to enter, they have a huge manufacturing facility here where they produce liquid detergent and a bunch of other things from Telangana. So I told them, I want you to actually tag along one of my institutes, in fact, uh, the Triple IT in Basra, where we have some brilliant, brilliant youngsters. I told them, please tie up with them and please create an apprenticeship model where the kid who's studying there in engineering or plus two can actually come over, spend six months in your, uh, in, in your, or as an intern or apprentice in your facility, in your manufacturing facility. And it's a win-win proposition for you and them. Because once you like, you know, what you see, you obviously have the luxury of uh, giving them an opportunity to work with you. And the kid also, the students also get an opportunity to learn. So we need four things. One, like I said, basic design thinking at school level, at a higher education level or vocational training level, we need to ensure an apprenticeship model happens. Three, we need to compete on scale. If you want to compete with the large manufacturing countries like China, we of course need to do uh, you know, we of course need to create the world's largest pharma parks, world's largest industrial parks, and through which economies of scale are bound to come. I'm delighted Sudhir Redigaru is doing something truly unique. With TIF and TSIIC, we are building up one of Telangana's largest industrial parks in Dandumal Kapur. I'm delighted it's shaping up really well, Sudhirana. Thank you very much. I would wish FTCCI, I would wish CII, I would wish FIKI, I would wish the Japanese also come together and create such large parks. And uh, going back to your point, Srinivas Garu, about how you ran out of space in Charlapalli and Pashamailaram, we need to learn from the Japanese there as well. You know, they, 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 have, they, have, they have done some very, very smart things. Either they have gone underground in some cases or they have even gone up vertically. So we need to also do a few of those disruptions and innovations because land is a very luxurious commodity and it's in limited supply, unfortunately. And it's getting more and more expensive. Because it's a demand-supply gap, isn't it? I mean, the more the demand is, the more difficult it is going to get for the government to procure land, for you to also be able to get a piece of land at a reasonable price so that, you know, your bottom line is not affected. So my request to all the industrialists in this room here, and this might sound bad coming from the industry minister of Telangana, but I'll say it anyway. You know, I liked what Srinivas said about Vega and how he started as a micro-entrepreneur how he grew from micro to a small, to a medium, to a, to, to a partner with now Daifuku. But if you really think, I was watching very carefully what Daifuku does in automation, in logistics. How many companies from India really have really, really disrupted and have become global names like Daifuku or like Sony or like Panasonic or like Honda or Toyota? How many of us really have come out with world-class products? which can compete on a world scale. I mean, I'm even talking about the Reliances and Tatas and other big industrial houses from India. We have done well. We have been growing, of course. We're a large country. We have, we have a large domestic market. But how many of these products that we have come out with are truly world class? You know, when I talk about the Japanese and the Koreans and when I can mention so many names and say they are truly world class, how many Indian companies are there which actually can be mentioned in the same breath? Which we talk about make in India, we talk about a lot of things. We talk about making for the world. But unfortunately, not many of these disruptions, not many of these inventions or innovations are truly world class. I think we need to start thinking on a larger scale. We need to start being a bit more ambitious. We need to start being a bit more aggressive as well. Because one thing I've seen in the last one decade of being a minister, almost a decade now, is that capital is not an issue if you, are, if you have an idea that can really work. Access to capital is no more a concern. There used to be a time in India when access to capital was a challenge. And the entrepreneurs were having a tough time raising money. But now, I think with the sort of government support, with the sort of capital flow that is coming in, 
with the world looking at us with renewed enthusiasm indian entrepreneurs need to make some bold moves indian entrepreneurs and especially those entrepreneurs from telangana who are sitting here please think big please think aggressively please start thinking of products for the world not just for india so i welcome daifuku i welcome the entire manufacturing ecosystem here and i am a truly strong believer that we have it in us to make world class products we have it in us to give a <laughs> to provide solutions for the world so i wish you all all the very best and i am as the minister from telangana as a state representative i'm happy to be a partner in your growth story so i welcome daifuku i welcome the entire team here thank you very much jai telangana jai hind